Welcome to episode number three of Oil Painting Question and Answers. If you have any questions for me, uh, leave them in the comments section of this video and I'll try to get to as many of those as I can in next week's show. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to uh, teach a little lesson on what I think are the four essential qualities in all good realism. And in order to um, teach that, I'm going to show you some great paintings by artists that I love and talk about all four of those qualities and how these artists uh, um, have all those qualities in, in their work. So before we get into looking at um, some great artwork, uh, which exemplifies the four essential qualities that I'm talking about, um, I want to discuss the first quality, which is values, that your values are in check, and that is the, the most important thing. And the reason I can't show you um, great artwork and then say, look how his values are, are so right, I can't do that because I don't have the source to, to compare it to. Um, but in your own work, while you're working, you can always check your values. You have to trust your color checking, especially if you're starting out and you've never used a color checker before. You absolutely have to ch trust your color checking, whether you're uh, ch checking on a laminated photograph or whether you're using a color checker and working from life. And you know, I can I can walk into somebody who's working on a, uh, one of my students who's halfway through a painting, and I can say, "Look at your cheek. Look at the shadow on their neck, or whatever it is." And if your color doesn't check right, then it ha then you fix it. There's you're never you're never gonna. Uh, have good realism if your values in your neck don't match the values in the shirt or the values in the ear or the values in the hair. Everything has to be in sync all along the whole spectrum from dark to light and, and that's why color checking is so valuable and you can always go in and check your work and see what, where your values are. Okay, so now let's talk about the other three qualities. Um, and these are things that you can uh, see in great paintings. Let's start with Thomas Aikens. Um, if we zoom in and look at this beautiful portrait that he's painted, and let's zoom in and look at the head here. Let's look at the lower lip. Notice how the bottom, the lower edge of the lower uh, lip is just disappears into the skin, both on the left and in the shadow. It's just not even there. There's, but an amateur will go in and draw a line where we don't even see one because you, you think you see the lip and you go in and you exaggerate and you overdefine, and that would be wrong. Now look at the reflection up in his forehead. Look how subtle it is. It's, it's just the very slightest bit lighter than the surrounding skin, and yet it's the reflection. And what an amateur would do is go in there and, and greatly exaggerate the shine and ha make it have a lot more pop than it really does. So he's maintaining the subtlety. Now let's look down in the bottom. Look at his, his foot. And notice the abstraction in the brushwork in the background. There's no pattern to it. There's no uh, distinct dot, dot, dot. It's, it's a random uh, you know, mixture of colors, spots. He's dragging his brush, he's, he's scrubbing it, he's doing all these things that, that bring in all this crazy abstraction. There's not, a, there's not a pattern to his brushwork. And this, let's look at this beautiful portrait of the First Lady. Let's zoom in and look at the face. Look at the left edge of her nose, how it's almost not even there. The whole left edge of her nose that goes in, it's, it's just, you can almost, if you really look at it, there's just no line, there's nothing even to distinguish the lower part of her nose on the left. It just disappears. An amateur would go in there and paint a line where they didn't see one. They would exaggerate the shine on the forehead. They would uh, delineate the lower lip so you could see it better. And yet all of those things are very subtle. And, and you, can, you can check that subtlety by checking your values. Now let's look at this portrait of Thomas Aiken's wife, one of my very favorite paintings in the world. Beautiful composition. I just love everything about it. Let's zoom in and look at her face. Look at her hair. Look at the abstraction. Look how there's no, you can't see individual lines. It's, it's as if somebody took a sponge and pressed it into the, the canvas or something. It's just it has texture that, that is not, there's no regular pattern to it. It's ma he's maintained the abstraction throughout his brushwork. 
Let's take a look at the rug and look at the brushwork in the rug. Let's look at the pattern. What an amateur would do is they would go in and paint a series of dots to, to indicate the pattern in the rug. But if you really look at what he's done, it's just a big mess. There's, it's just abstraction all the way through. There's very little uh, indication of pattern. Just the very slightest bit. And that very slight indication of pattern is, is all you need. Now let's take a look at Valentin Serov, a Russian artist, and this beautiful, beautiful portrait. I love this painting. Let's zoom in on her face. Notice how he has not overblended his colors. Notice how you can see all the swirls and jumble and mix of pinks and browns and greens. He hasn't taken a big soft brush and blended that cheek up. He's left it all nice and rough. Look at the hair. Look at the pattern in the hair. It looks nothing like hair. It's just a big mess, but it's abstract. It's very abstract. So what I tell my students is um, these four essential qualities are really things that you can focus on to improve the quality of your work. Um, make sure that your work has all four of these qualities in it and it's and each one of these you can go and check yourself you know uh, write these down on a piece of paper and you can look at paintings that you've painted a year ago or six months ago or two years from from now in the future and and pull that list out and ask yourself each one of those am I are my values right and that's something you can check if you still have your source in front of you especially if it's a photograph uh, the second thing is, um, am I um, exaggerating things? Am I, uh, you know, making things, uh, if I compare it to my source, am I, do, am I making things have more pop? Can I see uh, the lines in the shirt uh, stronger in my painting? Is the glow in the cheek brighter in my painting? Those are all things that you can check. Uh, the third one, am I over blending? That, that's something also that's very easy to look at your work and ask yourself, am I smoothing all my colors together? Because they should always be a jumble. They should always be mixed up and not all blended together. And then the very last uh, quality about maintaining the abstraction, that's one that uh, people don't think about a lot, but it's something about beauty, that if you see abstraction in something, it's appealing. And I don't, I don't know why, but in general, you know, I don't know if it comes from looking at nature, but if you look at a pile of leaves, there's incredible abstraction mixed with the pattern of the leaves. Um, if you look at you know, in, anything in nature, it tends to be like that. So, so maintain the abstraction and don't put in patterns where you don't see them. And that's it. So let's get into the questions. I find that the most difficult part of the entire painting process for me is composing a still life. I've watched your video on setting up a still life many times and it has been very helpful. Could you go into more detail about some elements that make a strong composition? Um, the thing about art in general is that there's no rules and composition is all about art and what I mean is it's about feelings and taste and I like this and I don't like that. And I've always felt like that art is something that you can't define. You can try to, you can make a rule and say, great art is this. And then I can find an a, a incredible masterpiece that violates that rule. And that seems to be the very strange nature of art and, and love and, and, and anything to do with feelings and the heart is that you can't define it. It's just a strange thing. But I mean, you can, you know, the rule of thirds, for instance, is a rule of composition that people hear a lot about. And so if you take somebody that doesn't have any idea about composition and you say, here, here's the rule of thirds, and they go out, maybe their paintings will go from looking, or their compositions will look from, go from looking amateur to looking, you know, uh, better. But there are great, wonderful paintings that violate the rule of thirds. And so I don't like any rules of composition. I, I feel like, um, you know, if you want to try new things, and, and uh, there's, there's all, it's all about discovery. And it's not about setting, uh, you know, a formula and then trying to meet that formula. So with that said, what I would encourage you to do, like I do in my video, is you 
you yourself have to be the one that loves it. So you throw something on a table, you play, you struggle, you try this, you try that, you try rule of thirds if you want, whatever, but you, you play. You play like a child and, and, and then you see something and it's that reaction, that is the thing, that is the thing that you have to trust, that is the only thing you've got to be able to judge whether you like something or not. And it has to be your own particular taste because that's going to be, you, you, you know, you can listen to all kinds of people and that you'll hear all kinds of opinions and some people might like this and some people might like that, but when, when that spark goes off, when you set something up in your shadow box and you just like it and it's, you don't even know why, you just say, I like that and you have a, you feel learning to be sensitive to that, that, uh, you know, that you like something and that it's going to work and trusting that and don't second guess yourself you know so much it's it's the mark of a great artist that you do second guess that you try new things but at some point if you have a reaction to something you've got to go with it and trust it and decide it's worth painting and you alone are the one that have to make that decision so i really don't want to comment on any rules of composition other than encouraging you to trust your own heart and your own love or, or for whatever it is that you yourself like I am loving your Geneva paint. The pigment is so strong. Is it possible to mix Naples yellow with your palette? Uh, yes, it is possible. Um, basically, Naples yellow, if you take uh, the Geneva cadmium yellow and just take pure cadmium yellow and then use a, a clean brush and take a spot of red, a spot of white, a spot of brown, and a lot of cadmium yellow. And I'm mixing Michael Harding at Naples yellow Naples yellow comes in all sorts of shades depending on the manufacturer and I could pick any one I wanted to to mix but I've just uh, got some Michael Harding here. Mine's slightly more not red enough so I'll just take a spot more of red and you can just do the six questions when you're trying to match one color to another. If it's darker or lighter or whether it's a shift in color you just ask the six questions. A little bit more red. Got to be real careful with that red because it's really potent. Touch, touch more. And that probably about gets it. Are you a fan of doing master's studies? If so, what do you take into consideration so you consciously learn something instead of mindlessly copying? Um, that's a very good question. When I used to teach my sergeant class, I made it a very clear to my students that I did not want them copying uh, sergeant uh, brushstroke for brushstroke. They're not doing forgery work. So, and it's real tempting to go in there and paint exactly what he did because it is easier to mindlessly copy like that. But what I, what I really uh, wanted them to learn, at least in copying sergeant's work, um, is to, is to you know, paint with just as loose a stroke as Sargent did and to paint and to, to realize what you can get away with. Because when you copy Sargent, you can't believe, uh, you know, how, how messy and how even ugly the brushwork looks up close. And so your brushwork should look just as ugly or just as, you know, messy as his does up close. And if you're not doing that, then you're not learning uh, how Sargent painted. But to copy and brushstroke for brushstroke totally misses the point. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's the, your approach should be. Now, one other thing about copying masters. There's a lot of people, and there's nothing wrong with doing this, but uh, if you're copying really old work, you know, like uh, Raphael or, or, you know, Michelangelo or, or whatever it is, those guys painted in an era that was different, and they didn't have, uh, you know, painting and, and uh, the, the mastery of oil paint and putting paint on canvas has changed and you have to pick your style but my style that I love is, is the John Singer Sargent style you know the sort of strong brushwork good colors a la prima painting and if that's what I like then I'm gonna copy paintings that are of that style because that's what I want to learn but it wouldn't do me any good to go back and look at a fresco or something and try to copy it in oil um, that's a whole different thing. Now, if you just happen to like those old paintings and you want to copy them to hang them on your wall, that's a whole different thing. But as far as learning, copy the style 
that you love. Do be aware of uh, getting a good source photography if you're working uh, from old, old work because that's a real, a real key and, and the vast majority of the images out there of paintings are horribly wrong in, 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 their, in the brightness and the contrast and the, in the colors and it's really important to have a good source to work from. Most galleries ask for 50% from an artist. How does an artist end up with what he wants for his paintings? And what are your thoughts on galleries getting 50%? Um, basically, there's a lot of expenses in running a gallery, and so the galleries have to make uh, some money. And even though 50% might seem like a lot, um, they're really uh, uh, very, very expensive. Most galleries don't succeed. The vast majority fail because it's a real difficult business to be in. It's really hard to sell enough artwork uh, to you know, pay all the bills. So in, in, in those, they really do need to take a commission. And it might seem like a lot, but you have to consider that a gallery is really a huge part of what defines the price of, of what you can get for a painting. You know, if you take uh, one painting and you uh, have it unframed in a small gallery in a, in a small town, that's one thing. And if you have that same painting in a beautiful frame and it's hanging in, in a you know, gallery on Fifth Avenue, New York, um, it could be worth 10 times the price. And it's the gallery really, uh, to a larger degree, that dictates what you can ask for your paintings. And so a lot of times, if you get into a good gallery, you know, you might be able to, to command 50% more than you could if you were in a small gallery or a gallery that's less known or just starting or whatever it is. So I would just, just you have to look at it. Don't ever look at, when you, when you have a, a painting uh, and you're going to price it, don't think about the price like this is what my art is worth to me or what it should be worth or anything like that. It's really about what, how much will people pay for it. And that is a huge part of that is the gallery that you're in. I'm using Geneva paints for the first time and they are great. A little seems to go a long way and the butteriness and, and even consistency is wonderful. Recently I've begun to paint plain air and the, I'm wondering if you have any tips about taking Geneva paints outdoors. Uh, no, they, they should perform wonderfully outdoors. In fact, the fact that you don't have to use any medium to dip your brush into is just one less thing you have to deal with. Just throw the paint on your palette and you're ready to go. Do you know how using walnut oil as a medium affects the paint? I have been using walnut oil in very small amounts because I paint in a small area and airflow is an issue. Um, first of all, let me, let me just compare walnut oil to linseed oil. There's a lot of misunderstanding about linseed oil. A lot of people think it's toxic. I, I don't know where that comes from. Maybe the fact that it, it's very often mixed with solvents or maybe because uh, there's a type of linseed oil called boiled linseed oil that has dryers in it and, and is very much toxic. Um, but regular old linseed oil, whether it's cold pressed linseed oil or whether it's refined linseed oil, um, in traditional oil paint, there's nothing toxic in and of itself in the linseed oil unless you're one of those very rare people that has an allergy to it. Uh, but that's very rare. So, and certainly not breathing the, the vapors uh, of linseed oil is there, there, you know, that is, there's no toxicity there whatsoever. So, um, and if you wanted to choose uh, walnut oil versus linseed oil, uh, linseed oil actually forms a stronger paint film. This is from my a book called, uh, uh, by Ralph Mayer, The Artist's Handbook, um, which is a fabulous resource that I've used for, for many years from the very beginning of my career. And, and Ralph Mayer is somebody who's really done the research. Um, you know, go, go Google him and, and find out, and you can read about his credentials. But I really trust uh, what, he's, what he has to say because he's really done the long-term testing. There's a lot of uh, people have a lot of opinions about art supplies and what materials are best. And I don't want to argue with anybody, but I'm just going to tell you what I trust. And Ralph Mayer uh, basically says that uh, linseed oil is a much uh, a better um, medium t to mix with pigment than either poppy oil or walnut oil and that the walnut and poppy oils uh, over time tend to crack so that's why I prefer linseed oil but don't be afraid of linseed oil um, it's the solvents that, that, that are the toxic thing to breathe not the oils in the paint what is your opinion about working with a dirty brush in other words not fully cleaning your brush while moving around the painting 
Um, first of all, let me just address cleaning your brushes in general. I, I have a video on my website, drawmixpaint.com, called Why I uh, Never Clean My Brushes or Why I Work With Dirty Brushes. And it's a free video and you can go watch that. But as far as moving around the canvas, there's two things that I do. Uh, it, it would be completely impractical to clean your brush with mineral spirits every time you pick up a new color. That would be, nobody could do that. So what I do instead is I keep about 14 brushes. And that sounds like a lot, but I either leave them on a little brush rack next to me or I just keep them all grouped in my hand together. And when I'm ready to go to a new color, I look at all my tips and I try to pick a color that's most like the color I'm about to pick up. In other words, if I'm going to do a really dark color, I'm looking for a really dark brush. If I'm painting something white, I'm looking for a light brush. And you get as close as you can. And then before I just go and pick up some color to paint with it, the first thing I do is I pick the brush that's closest, I grab it, I go over and I pick up some color, like some shadow color on the cheek that I'm about to paint, pick up a little bit of it, but I don't paint with it. I work it on the palette, clean the brush in it, and then I go and wipe it on a paper towel, and then I go and pick up that cheek color again. And this time, I pick it up. It's My brush has already had that color in it, and then when I stroke it on the canvas, it doesn't instantly turn to milk. And that seems like maybe a waste of paint, but there is no other way that I know, that I know how to do it. Even if you were to clean it, your brush with mineral spirits between colors, you would spend more on mineral spirits, and your studio would smell like with vapors and everything else. So anyway, that's the most practical way to deal with uh, working with uh, a dirty brush is use a lot of brushes and clean your brush before you use it with the paint you're about to paint. I have a question on color mixing. I find myself getting lost going through your process of mixing a color. Could you explain the technique of mixing a yellow or other highly saturated color? Uh, sure. Um, before I do, make sure that you're getting the very latest lesson from me on color mixing, which is uh, if you go to drawmixpaint.com and go to the color mixing chapter. Um, and then in that chapter, there's a specific section called how to mix a single color. And that's really the meat of the whole color mixing process. If you do that, that will teach you to match one color to another. It's a flow chart write it out or print it out or whatever and do it to the letter or just keep your iPad or laptop open while you're mixing colors but do it to the letter like a flow chart it's and and if you do that you're gonna be able to match one color to another it works every time but uh, as far as mixing a highly saturated color um, one of the things is a general rule in color mixing is that you always, uh, if you're going to attempt to make, say, match a yellow, if you've got a yellow sunflower and you're trying to match the color for it, um, make the color, start by making the color too strong. So start with a pure cadmium with a clean brush and match the, the yellow and it's almost for sure going to be too strong. And so to tone that down is real easy. You just add a touch of purple to it. I mean just a little bit and then compare it again but it's easier to tone a color down from being too strong to bringing it down to more of a neutral than it is to go the other way around um, so always that's what I do and a lot of times when people have trouble and they're like I can't get this color I can't get this color I tell them well let's just make it as strong as we can to start with and then go from there instead of starting with a dirty color and trying to kick it up and kick it up Hi Mark, I ordered a full set of your Geneva paint. Because of the fat over lean rule, for those of us who have time commitments and need to work in layers, would it be a good idea to add a few drops of mineral spirits to the first session, straight from the jar for the middle sessions, and a few drops of linseed oil to the last sessions? Uh, first of all, don't waste your time with the mineral spirits because um, the mineral spirits is not going to change the percentage of the oil because it evaporates from the paint film you know, after a day or two and you're back where you started. So it doesn't do any good to add the mineral spirits. Plus, you don't want to get in. If you're going to use the Geneva paint, I would try to maintain a solvent-free studio. I mean, it's a wonderful thing not to have to breathe any vapors at all. Um, and so, but, but going to your last uh, point about adding a few drops of linseed oil, that's exactly what you would do is just add a few drops of linseed oil to each layer. Uh, so that the top layers have a, a slightly higher uh, ratio of oil. 
than the bottom layers. And if you want your paint to dry slower, use cold pressed linseed oil. If you want it to dry a little faster, use refined linseed oil. Do you always mix other colors to get black or will you ever use black as it is? And a related question is, what is the mixture ratio you have chosen for burn umber and ultramarine blue that results in your Geneva black? Uh, yeah, I always make my black by mixing ultramarine blue and burn umber. Um, it makes a black that's as, just as black as ivory black or Mars black. And um, if, if you were to hold it under a very bright light and compare one to the other, you might find that um, there are some blacks that are darker than what you can make with ultramarine and burn umber. Uh, but it's important that you use the correct burn umber and the correct ultramarine. If you're using, um, you know, there are certain ones that will make, you know, milky blacks or blacks that aren't as good. Uh, the, bla the, the ultramarine that we use in Geneva paint and the burn umber mixed together to make a wonderful dark, dark black that has really nice undertones when it gets blended into other colors. Um, and as far as the ratio goes on, um, you know, one to the other uh, and, and what we put in our, it's, it's really hard to say because different manufacturers have different amount of pigments in their, in their colors, so it really depends on, on what brand of paint you're using and, you know, whether their ultramarine is highly pigmented or not or whatever. Um, the, Geneva, the Geneva paint that we make, we make it from the ground up. Um, uh, in other words, we actually mix the powders together and then build the medium and the oil together to match the black and we actually make it slightly more, have a slightly more leveling quality than you would get if you just mixed our ultramarine and our burn umber together. And I just like that because black, it's really nice to have a little bit extra leveling. As I travel quite a bit, I run into problems with my paint drying on the canvas and palette before an object is complete which makes blending impossible. Moreover, while the paint on the canvas is mostly dry to the touch, it does not seem to dry uh, enough for re-oiling. Um, first of all, if the painting is truly dry to the touch where you're not gonna get any wet paint on your finger when you touch it or rub on it, then it's perfectly fine at that point to oil out the paint and to rub, rub some linseed oil into it. Um, and you're gonna do that, you know, don't use too much. Uh, watch my video on oiling out on, on uh, drawmixpaint.com, it's a free video. Um, but as far as dealing with your paint drying on your canvas, what I've always done is if, let's say I'm painting a still life, is I'll paint one object, like one little, you know, could be even a, fl a single flower or, or even part of an object, but finish that part of the object or that object and paint a little background around it. And that way when all that paint dries, it's gonna be a lot easier to take wet paint and to blend into that little bit of background instead of hitting a hard edge of, a, of, of an object, which is another reason why I always say that you should paint a little background around whatever object you're painting. But if you do that, just let it get dry, oil it out, and then you may have to remix your colors. If your colors are dry on your palette, there's nothing you can do. You have to remix it. There's only so much uh, time that you can retard the drying of oil paint. I love your horse portrait and I'm interested in painting horses. Will you be offering a video or workshop teaching us how to paint horses? Um, not in the foreseeable future, um, I think, but I do want to uh, remind you that basically uh, my method for painting is exactly the same for horses as it is for still life, as it is for um, a, you know, a regular portrait of a person. And so it's the very same method and it's exactly like painting a still life. Regarding the fat over lean rule, do your Geneva oil paints contain more oil, less oil, or about the same as standard tube paint? Um, because the Geneva paint already has the medium mixed into it, in general they would have more oil, but if you're painting um, with another type of, another brand of paint and you're mixing medium into it, it's going to really depend on what medium you use and how much oil it has. Um, as to whether or not the Geneva paint would have a higher ratio of oil. And since I don't know what kind of medium you're, you might be using or how much you've thinned your paints down, all those things come into play. But in general, the uh, Geneva paint is different because tube paint, you have to thin it down with medium before you can put it on your canvas. And the Geneva paint, you just put it on your palette and paint with it. Simple as that. So it's already got the medium in it. So it, in general, would have more oil in it than tube paint.
When you talk about having a dark cloth hanging behind you in your studio, do you mean in front of you as in behind your easel or do you mean there's a dark backdrop actually behind your back? Uh, yes, a, draw, a dark backdrop actually behind my back. So if I'm sitting here and my easel's in front of me, behind me there's no big bright white walls, there's no windows that are light, there's no uh, light that's behind me like a lamp that's creating glare. In this photo in our online course you can see how uh, I've hung a black curtain behind my wife's home studio and you don't have to rearrange your whole room just just uh, have a cloth that you can you know string a rope or a wire uh, across the ceiling and, and put a dark cloth on shower curtain rings and just uh, pull it across you, behind you, when you're uh, ready to paint. And that'll get rid of almost all the glare. Well, that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions for me, leave them in the comment section of this video, and I'll get to as many of those questions as I can next Thursday.